good morning. Is it good morning? Good morning, everyone. Good morning. It's really nice to be here today. I love that. And it, thank you for the extended slow clap, the one person in the audience. I appreciate that. Um, name is Chiwan, and we recently moved to Isan, um, maybe about three months ago. We've been in Korea for two and a half years. Um, we were out in San Francisco just before we came here. One of the biggest challenges of moving to Korea with a young family is the question of like, where do we go for school? Because, you know, obviously my kids or two of my kids, my third kid was born in, um, he was born in Korea. But the two kids, they were three and three months old when we migrated to Korea. And there's obviously a bit of a backstory to how we came up, ended up here. But one of the biggest questions we had was like, what are we going to do about school? Because as you guys might be aware or may not be aware, uh, foreign schools in Korea, international schools can be quite pricey, like the price of even college, right? So it's like to take three kids through international school from kindergarten to year 12 would be, um, I would need a million dollars, you know what I'm saying? And so like one of the biggest questions was like, man, what are we going to do about schooling? And then just through like kind of some events that happened with our housing. We found some amazing housing in Seoul. We lived there for one year. We were out in Busan for one year. Um, and then we're like, okay, we signed a one-year lease. Little did we know that we were going to get pregnant and have a third. And so in the midst of my third child being born, Ezra, um, we had to move house. And then the only house that was available to us was a church member who said, hey, I got a place in Ilsan. It's a little bit far because we were out in like close to Hongdae. Uh, do you guys know Hongendong? Anyone know Hongendong? Where the Pokpo is, where the waterfall is. We were very close to there. And our church is in Seoul. And so we're like, okay. We looked on the map, right? And then it's like, Isan is like, boom, like out here. We're like, Isan's Hogu, like kind of like close to Paju too. So we're like, no, nah, we can't go to that place. But long story short, we ended up coming to this house out here in faith. And then we, we, I ran into your principal uh, one week and it was such a divine appointment of like just seeing things line up, seeing, hearing about Juniper. We actually saw Juniper when we we're driving. Oh, there's an international school here. And then I got to meet your principal and then um, had a conversation. So got to find out about Juniper through your principal, but also just kind of like the turn of events in our life. And so my daughter would... I don't want to promise, but my daughter's six. Next year, she's in year one, so she might be coming to Juniper, okay? So just like, you know, we're praying, okay? And so, anyway, that's, I didn't mean to share that, but that's kind of, we're, we're at, at, out here at Isan. We planted Ark one year ago, so a lot of milestones coming up. We have our one-year anniversary service coming up in two Sundays. So not this Sunday, but the following Sunday. Ark Church will be one years old. And so it's an international church, English speaking church, a lot of third culture people coming through. Um, and that's kind of what God put on our hearts. But um, just want to say uh, thank you for having me today. It's an honor to be here at Juniper School. Um, I'm so blessed by the energy in this room. I love the, the amens and the, the responses that's here. It feels very alive. And so many announcements, so many things going on in your school, man. You guys are busy. And so. Um, it's really nice to see such a vibrant community that's here. Um, my question today, I guess, that I'll start off with is like, what do you think about when you hear the word home? Let me just get the clicker right here. I got a lot of gadgets here today. What do you guys think about when you think about when you hear the word home? Anyone want to throw out some words or pictures or what do you think about immediately? Don't think too much. Home. What do you think? Heaven. Heaven, oh, so deep, who was that? Okay, you're too deep right now, you're too deep. Okay, anyone else, like, it's just real, what was that? Sleep. Sleep, okay, so something like sleep, okay, cool, rest and sleep. Anyone else? Homework. Homework, oh my, oh, that hurts. What, how old are you, man? I'm so sorry, dude. Um, any other words, anyone want to throw out? Safety. Safety, that's good, I love that, safety. I don't know. Maybe for some of us, it's, it ranges, right? Maybe it's like rest, warmth, safety, trust. What do you? Eating. eating, yeah, it's a place where I get to eat, be refueled, refilled, replenished. So the idea of home or the word of home, it can bring good connotations, right? 
And maybe when it comes to home, I don't want to get into more of maybe the negative side of home. It could be like a tense place. It could be a tough place. And if, that, it, if that's the reality for you, I'm sorry to hear that. But when it comes to this word home, sometimes we think we connect it to something that's just familiar and comfortable. When you think about home, it's a place that I can just be myself. Maybe when we kind of extrapolate the idea of home from just my home, hometown. Maybe you guys think about like Isan. Maybe you guys think about Korea, Seoul. Or maybe for some of you guys in this room, home is across the oceans and it's in a different place altogether. Oftentimes we, we think home is this place that anchors us. But what happens when we move? in life. Has anyone here moved houses and felt sad about moving houses or suburbs or cities? Give me honest. How many of you guys have moved countries even and moved different to, to, to like different schools, right? If you haven't left your country or if you haven't left your home and moved somewhere significant, there's a high chance that you will in the future as well. The idea of leaving home and leaving behind a sense of familiarity and what's safe, it can be almost traumatic. It's a difficult experience to leave behind something that's so safe, familiar, and something that's constant in your life, right? You think, you think that family's constant. You think that your friends are constant. You think that your neighborhood and your ba favorite bakery, restaurant, these things would be constant. But in, throughout life, somehow we end up in different places. And so when I was three years old, I remember growing up in Busan, because I was born in Busan. Anyone from Busan? Oh. Yeah, Busan. Ooh, ooh. I love Busan, right? Home of the beautiful ocean, beautiful heaven there, the seas, and good kukpap. But it's like, when I grew up in Busan, I was, part of, I was living in an apartment with a lot of other people that we knew. And so... I just remember, I don't have like a lot of memories, but I just remember it being very filled with people. Like my grandparents were there, my uncles were there, church people were there. So I, I just grew up around feeling like I was around people. And then at three, my dad decided to go to a Sydney, Australia. Anyone from Sydney, Australia? Just one person. Hey, what's up? <laughs> um, so I went to Sydney, Australia, and I just, I just remember feeling like, where am I? You know, because when you're in Korea, you live in Apatu, you know, and it's like there's people everywhere. It's so dense, right? And then I went to Australia and it's just so vast. Like there's nothing around. There's no people around. I went to a land of like blonde hair and blue eyes and, you know, Vegemite and just like weird, thick Australian accents. And so I, I, I moved out to Australia and everyone looked different. And I just, my trauma of like when I was not three, but four, I went to school for the first time and everyone's white Australian. And I remember crying out to Omma and saying, Omma, Kajima. <laughs> and my mom said she walked away hearing me scream top of my mouth, lungs, Kajima, right? And she was crying. Oh, and she was like, but she had to leave me at school, you know? And so it's like this traumatic experience of leaving home. Maybe our memories we might forget, but our body does not forget, right? Our hearts do not forget. To lose the things that are so familiar and safe and good for us, when we lose that, it is traumatic. It's tough. You know, my, when I look back now, I look back and see that God took my parents on a journey. And little did I know that the seeds of their decisions would be planted in me and it would take years and decades later for me to process the significance of that journey and to also embark on my own journey. And now with my kids, my daughter was three when we immigrated from where she was born in America to Korea. It's kind of weird, right? We didn't plan it that way, but God has a way of planting seeds. Um, and as we grow older, we begin to see and walk into the significance of those painful and traumatic moments, but deeply significant moments. So I wanted to ask you guys today, what about you guys, right? What about you guys? Has there been challenges in your life as, as you've journeyed, as you've moved? Maybe even moving schools is tough, right? Sense of losing friends, teachers. Maybe you've lost a loved one. But to lose 
the sense of familiarity and home. It is difficult. I want to share with you guys the passage for today. And it's in Genesis chapter 12, verse 1 to 3. And it says, The Lord said, had said to Abram, can somebody say Abram? Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. God's call for Abram was to leave, to go. Go from your country. Leave your people. Leave your father's house. Leave everything behind. Leave your friends. Leave your comforts. Everything that's familiar. And go somewhere where everything is unfamiliar. Where everything is unknown. That's crazy. Leave behind everything. Your identity. Your rep Hey, my reputation. Hey, I was funny back at home. I was popular back at home. I was one of the faster ones back at home. Like there's an identity that you have within a certain culture, but to leave that all behind, leave your friends, everything behind, that's a huge challenge. That's a faith journey. To leave behind what we know, what we trust, what we're familiar with, it exposes us. I'm vulnerable, right? I'm no longer the guy, or I'm no longer the girl. It's a huge, huge challenge. But this is where Abram's faith journey began. Can somebody say faith? faith. Abram's faith journey began the moment he chose to answer God's call and leave behind the familiar. Faith is to trust in something beyond certainty or circumstances. Although I might not have my plan set out, although I might not have everything in my life figured out, just to have faith and trust that he who calls me will be faithful. The person who called me to this, I'm going to trust in him. It goes beyond my circumstances. Because how many of you guys know in this room when you move countries, it's pretty rough? How many of you guys know when you move schools, it's pretty rough? Even when you go up to middle school from your elementary school, it's pretty rough because you're in a whole new environment and you have to learn and restart everything. Abraham left everything and God called him to do that. You see, God called him. There was God's intent behind it. And what is God's intent behind calling Abraham? He called Abraham because in that place, of leaving behind everything, you learn to truly trust in God. You learn first truly what you trust, and then you have the opportunity to truly trust in something outside of yourself. I want you guys to know that the theme of leaving behind and feeling a sense of loss for home for Abraham, the theme was faith. In verse 2, I'll read it for us, it says, and I will make you a great nation. And I will bless you and make your name great. So that you will be a blessing. Can somebody say blessing? blessing. I will bless those who bless you. And him who dishonors you, I will curse. And in all the families of the earth shall be blessed. There was a call, but there was also a promise. Can somebody say promise? There was a promise given to Abraham. He was called to leave, but there was also a promise. And God said, through you, I will bless everyone. And those who bless you will be blessed. And those that curse you will be dishonored. And so God is saying, literally, I got your back. No matter what happens, although you might not have a plan, although you might not have friends there, although you might not have an advantage there, although you might not have things like you know, that you used to have back at home, I myself will take care of you. Guaranteed. And so God is saying to Abraham, what, and so maybe Abraham was kind of the more anxious type. Maybe he was more of the risk averse type. Maybe he was like, leave everything behind. Maybe he wrestled for a while. Maybe God called him and it wasn't so quick where it was just one verse and then boom, he left. Maybe he received the call and maybe he wrestled. Maybe he cried. Maybe he was anxious. Maybe he was worried. It's okay to be worried and anxious. It's human, right? 
But ultimately, Abraham, in his mind, as he was called, counted the cost, and he remembered the promise, and he said, you know what, God? If you will be with me, and if you will bless me through this journey, then I will go. I don't know exactly what was going through Abram's mind, but he went, and he went despite the difficulties. He, despite all the challenges that lay in front of him, he still went. It was a golden opportunity for him. Speaking of golden opportunity, um, Korea was, um, Korea was, did you know Korea was like, Right after the Korean War, 1953, it was the po second poorest nation in the world. It was poorer than even the poorest African nation at the time. It was like GDP of like $57 or something. Like it was, I mean, per person. It was like, it was poor. It, world, world Vision said that it was one of the poorest nations in the world. And so Korea experienced, as, like right now, like I, I checked this morning, 14th largest economy in the world, right? Richest economy, right? So we went from literally poorest to richest. But through the progression of Korea's rise, was, it's so intertwined with the, Christ, the, the mission movement. Missionaries came, sowed into the country, preached the gospel, built schools, built hospitals, built churches, and through the revitalization of, through the growth of Christianity, explosive growth of Christianity, Korea rose from the ashes, right? Before we even talk about kind of the rise of Christianity, even in modern times, I want to share with you guys a story of um, a missionary from, uh, a Welsh missionary a Wel from Wales. And in, 18, in the 1800s, 1866, he, his name was Robert Germain Thomas. And he, how many of you guys gone to the missionary graveyard in Hapjong? Have you guys ever been there? It's, it's, it's not far, it's, it's a really, I've been there a couple of times and it, it really moves my heart to see the people that laid down their lives. Even the kids died, you know, wives died. It's powerful, but these men laid down their lives. This man laid down his life and his, he was so gripped. When he was in college, he was so gripped by this country named Korea that he wanted to share the gospel at all costs. And so before 1900s, this is 1866, he attempted to bring Christian literature in Chinese to Korea by a trade expedition that came down a boat named General Sherman. The ship then, as they were coming off the ship, they were attacked or they were confronted by Koreans, right? And through the conflict, he was killed in the skirmish. But according to accounts, the last act that he did was he screamed Jesus, Yesu, and he offered the Bible to them as he was dying, making him known as one of the first known missionaries to die for the gospel in Korea and inspiring many more to come after him. There's another man that I'll share with you guys. His name is John Ross. And this man, he was from Scotland and he traveled to China in 1872. So not long after, maybe like seven, eight years, seven years after um, Robert Germain Thomas. This man, he traveled by ship with his wife um, to go to Manchuria. So the, kind of the, the northeast side of China, kind of bordering North Korea. And he went there with a heart for China. And at the time, it was largely still closed off to foreigners. And, you know, it was still a hostile environment for Christianity and missionaries. But he, was, but he went there with his wife. They had their first child. The first child got so sick, wife had to go back home. But he stayed. And through all of these like, extreme hardships, like isolation, harsh climate, threat of violence, anti-Christian sentiment. Like there was so much that was just against him, yet he stayed. And not only that, he translated the Bible into Korean. There's no like documentation. There's no Google neighbor. There's like nothing. He just had to literally talk to these Korean people. 
and like f from his Chinese that he learned, he had to translate from English Kore to Chinese to Korean. And ultimately, he had his kids died. He had multiple kids that died. His wife died, but he did not stop living for God's mission. This is kind of a crazy example, but it's not that long ago, like 100, 120 years, 130 years. Like we stand on the foot of, uh, we stand on the shoulders of giants and like these men ultimately at high personal cost, they left everything they knew for a higher, higher purpose. And this is kind of an intense, you might be like, whoa, okay, that got intense real quick. This man lost his wife, he lost his children, he lost, because that's home, right? In some senses, right? Home is where your family is. He lost everything, yet he stayed and he translated the Bible. Now, fast track, like Korea, 1953, poorest nations, gospel booms. It's like, wow, those things that happened in 1953, the seeds were already planted in 1877, right? So the seeds are being planted through each life that are, that are leaving the things behind, the worldly things behind, comfort, certainty, and they're going for the gospel. They're, they're answering to the call. And through their life and obedience, there's fruit that comes from it. I want you guys to see that. They went to good schools. They had loving family and friends. They had community. They had I don't know, green card, I mean, see the American passport, like they had things, uh, Welsh passport, right? They're all settled. They left behind all these things to live a life by faith, trusting God wholeheartedly. And through their life, through their trusting in God, there was so much fruit, abundant fruit that came from it. You see in verse two, it, I mean, when we look at our passage today, he says, I, I will make you a great nation. I'll bless you so that you will be a blessing. The promise, it's amazing. I'm sure when these men got called to go to share the gospel, it was amazing. Like, man, yeah, of course I'll go to Korea. Of course I'll go to China. And we start off that way. We always start off that way. The beginning is amazing because the dream is there, right? It's like, oh yeah. I'll go and I'll serve the gospel. I'll do meaningful things, right? But the reality was Abraham faced a lot of challenges. He's faced so many hardships. And if we look at these modern men, uh, these men too, they face incredible challenges. The journey of faith isn't easy. It is a higher call, but it isn't easy. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 13, I don't know if I have it up, but this is more paraphrased, but let me read the actual passage. It says, these men, and they're talking about all these people that live their lives by faith. They said, these all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. Abraham did become a great nation but he didn't receive his promises in his lifetime. Oofed. That brings us to a question. Are you willing to live a life by faith? Are you willing to answer to God's call? Are you willing to live for something greater? Even if what's promised to you is not fulfilled in your lifetime. Even if all of my toil, if all of my efforts, all of my decisions that I make that maybe the crowd doesn't make, right? That's Christianity today. The way, the way that I, when I go out into the world, the way I live, the way that I choose to be is fundamentally different to the people of the world, right? And they'll look at you a certain way. They'll raise their eyebrows at you. And it's like we live our lives, when we live our lives for God, it's different. And when we live our lives for God, what if we don't receive all of the fruit of that, the result of that in my lifetime now? Will I still trust God? Will I still live for God? Will I still continue on on the journey, even when the cost is great? Even when it seems like it's inefficient? We live in a world of efficiency, effectiveness, 
productivity. We live in a world of self-actualization. Be the best version that you can be. Be happy. Do all the experiences of the world and you'll be happy. Get all the achievements. Get the cars. Get the success. And it's these things that are promised to us. And we feel like once we get there, we'll be happy and fulfilled. But in God, that's not the answer. But when we follow God, you guys see what I'm saying here, but we follow God, we live by faith, but the cost is great sometimes. The promise is delayed sometimes. The journey is long sometimes. It's slower than I thought. And in that journey, will you trust God? Abraham was promised something, but he didn't see the fullness of it. He got glimpses and tastes of it, but he didn't see the fullness of what was given to him. This, boils us, this brings us to a, another question. Will God himself be enough for you? Will your relationship with God be enough for you? Because if it's results that we're seeking, you'll be quickly discouraged. If the journey of faith, what if the outcome of the journey of faith was not some result and my ultimate happiness? But what if the outcome was me learning to walk with God, me learning to trust God, me learning to really love God and His people? The greatest value of our journey of faith is not found in the results, but it's found in my relationship with God. Apostle Paul said this, I didn't put it up there, but he said in Philippians chapter 3, Indeed, I count everything as loss. Indeed, I count everything as loss compared to the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. I considered everything loss. In this life, I was a I was accomplished, I had everything that I wanted, that I ever sought out after. But at the end of the day, I realized everything was a loss compared to this one thing, and that is to know Jesus my Lord. Paul saw not just his life on earth, but he saw eternity. He realized, man, if I could invest just this time on this earth to live for the one thing that truly matters, then my joy, my my happiness, all of those things that I deeply seek and desire will be fulfilled in this one person, in my relationship with God, and it will flow out from that place. Apostle Paul saw Jesus. And Jesus was the first third culture kid. Jesus left home. The, the deep brother who said heaven, right? Jesus left heaven. He left home. To come down. Thanks, brother. I appreciate that's really encouraging. <laughs> so Jesus left home. Oh. Uh, it's okay. Jesus, um, Jesus left his heavenly home for you and I. And it says in John chapter 1, verse 14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory and glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. God, Jesus, came. He left his heavenly home for you and I. Just like Abraham left his home, just like Isaac left his home, his son, just like Jacob left his home, just like Joseph left home, just like Moses left home, just like Daniel, you know, list goes on. Just like so many of those men in the Bible, men and women in the Bible, the lineage of faith was created by those who left behind the people that left behind earthly things for the greater thing. If you've left home before, if your parents have left home before for God, then you're standing in good company. You're standing in the company of those who lived for a greater story and for a greater purpose. And so my encouragement to you guys today is, the fun is a little bit blue, but live for a greater story. You have the opportunity as an international community to live in God's story. Live in His story. Live your life by faith. See your life in the lens of faith. And what faith means is to trust. To trust in God. 
to trust that God is leading you, that God is with you in this very season. It's hard to trust God when it's painful. It's hard to trust God when it's lonely. It's hard to trust God. It's easy to trust God when it's like things are rolling, but in the middle, when it's hard, when there's stress, there's hardship, it's difficult to trust God. But it's in those difficult moments that's the true opportunity to trust in God and to know it's painful. You can't, it's hard to sidestep that. It is painful. There are moments and seasons where it is painful. But to trust in God despite those things is where we progress and grow in our faith. To stay with, with God in the journey. To look to God in that journey. If you feel out of place, you feel rejected, you feel lost, you feel like disadvantaged, you feel like all of these like things are against you. And you feel just like, man, why am I in this situation? God's got you in this situation because it's an opportunity for you to trust in Him. You know, when I was growing up, because I'm like immigrant through and through, because I was three, went to Australia, grew up playing uh, rugby and cricket, you know, like I, all my friends were white until high school. And so I was like super like confused at who I was. And like growing up, went to college and all in Sydney and like, obviously like I'm, I had a good childhood, like I didn't have a bad childhood, but there was always this sense of like, I'm not Australian. And then, got, and then after I met Jesus and recommitted my life to Jesus, I went out to America and I spent 10 years in California. And as I was in California, I, I very much felt like I was an American. Like I'm like, oh, this is different too. Like Australia and America, very different, culturally very different. So I'm like, man, this is different. Like, this is crazy. And, and during the height of 2020, do you guys know stuff that happened in 2020? Like, you know, Black Lives Matter, like, sorry guys, I'm sorry, yeah. But I'm um, like, there was a lot of stuff that happened in America. And like, I just remember thinking, I want to care about this. And there came a moment where I was like, I don't really care about this. And it was like, I'm culturally Korean, Australian. I'm in America and I'm trying to care about the politics. And it was genuine, authentic. But it was just like, it w didn't feel like my fight. Have you ever felt like that? And I remember feeling like, man, this is like being an immigrant. It's like, I just feel like I'm never the, like within the culture. And I never felt like I had the advantages or the opportunities that other people had. I don't want to say never, that's a strong word, but I felt like I was always a little bit behind. Like I had to try a little harder. So what I'm trying to say is sometimes being different, I felt like it was a curse. But in God's story, what I thought was a disadvantage actually became my greatest, like, it's what makes me unique. It's actually a blessing. And I began to see, oh man, as I come to Korea now, I started, we started Art Church together last year and we're serving people from all different cultures. And it's in the journey of faith as we learn to trust God and walk with God that he begins to really allow every part of our journey to have greater purpose and meaning. Every part of our pain, our rejection, our hardships, they become a part of my story, but grafted into God's story of redemption. You see, I get to serve all kinds of immigrants, people that are in Korea for a short time. And it's such a blessing to be able to see that pain, it's something that we can't fully erase from our experience. But under God, our pain becomes such a source of blessing for others. We're able to empathize. We're able to have the capacity to be with others who are hurting and to be a blessing to those who are hurting, to be a friend to those who feel like they're such outsiders. And so one of the wonderful things I, like, I love about Juniper from the moment I saw the website was like Christ-centered global leaders. Leaders bear pain. This is not my definition, but there's a definition. Forget the author. Leaders bear pain. Leaders bear responsibility, burdens, uncommon burdens, and in some senses, unnecessary burdens. But leaders, they bear pain. Because through pain, we're able to create the capacity and the space 
to walk with people and to truly love people. And I, want to, I want you guys to see this in the passage today and in the story of the gospel before I close. And that is Jesus left his heavenly home to bear pain. It wasn't his to bear, but he died up. He lived the life that he lived. He lived 30 years of hiddenness, anonymous living, and three years of intense ministry. And then he died on the cross and he was resurrected. He bore pain so that through his pain would come abundance and blessing for all of us, for others. The journey of faith, it's a, it's a difficult one, but it's a beautiful one. Because through our pain, we have purpose. Through our pain, there is blessing and abundance that comes for those around us. Will you trust in Him today? I don't know what you're going through, and maybe it's not just for the, the students, but even for the teacher that's here. What's the burdens that you're carrying in this season? What are the uncommon burdens? What are the uncertainties you're wrestling with? What are the rejections that you feel? Or I don't know, just a sense of loss. He sees you. He's called you. And He's inviting you to trust in Him even still in this season. God, I still trust you. God, I offer my heart to you. I open up to you because I trust you. You're my refuge. You're my home. It's not some, some place back even in my hometown or here or there. It's not some fantasy. But you are my home. And God, I open up my heart to you and I trust in you today. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he'll make your path straight. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean on your circumstances. Don't lean on your emotions. Don't lean on the things that you, know, you can see, feel, or touch. But trust in the Lord with all your heart.